Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Outlier YouTube channel and our Get to Know program. I'm your host, D.P. Lyle, here with my partner in crime. And I would be that partner in crime. I'm Kathleen Antrim. And today we've got Matt Coyle with us. He's a best-selling author. He has won many awards for his writing, and we are so happy to have him here. Hey, Matt. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you very much for having me. This is um, just really such a treat, and um, really want to hear a little bit about uh, how you grew up, and if you felt like your childhood contributed to um, being a writer. Yeah, I would say yes. Uh, I'm four out of five uh, children, so... Wow there's a level of competition there you know the best spot on the couch in front of the black and white television way back then. <laughs> exactly. uh, so uh and there's a bit of uh there's a bit of writing in the blood actually my gr my mother's grandmother yeah came across the west in a covered wagon and she wow. wrote she wrote poems about that life and and uh, uh funny little poems but my father's, which were, I think my, one of my uncles, great uncles, had a little, they had him printed up at one point and, and I wish I could find the little book of uh, her poems. But on the other side, my dad's great aunt, or aunt, my great aunt, was, uh, you guys ever heard, hear of a little play called Harvey, about the six foot invisible rat? Oh, absolutely. A movie with Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, my great aunt was Mary Chase who wrote that. Really? Oh my wow. gosh! How cool is yeah. that? Yeah, and when I was years ago, when I was being interviewed for something, I they asked something. My life's been pretty. Uh, you guys asked me about my childhood. This is gonna be very boring. We'll have to cut this section. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. But, this is good. But so at one point, no, this is this is the good stuff. It gets worse. So at one point, <laughs> um, I was being interviewed, and they asked them something interesting people might not know about you. So the Mary Chase thing, because nobody did. But I looked, I just I thought, well, I don't want to screw anything up. I mean, I met her twice when I was eight or 10. Mm -hmm. So I better I'm gonna just look up a little history, make sure I don't get anything wrong. And it turns out that Harvey was uh, won a Pulitzer. <laughs> for, oh. <laughs> wow. And I knew my oh, great aunt, you know, we're, we're on the Irish side, so she liked to drink a little bit. And but I <laughs> but I didn't know that the judges like to drink too for the Pulitzer because you know, great play, great movie, but um it's about an invisible rabbit or a guy who thinks he yeah. has a best friend. So uh, apparently they were there was uh, interesting voting that year, but anyway, so, <laughs> so it's in the blood a little bit, but uh I, I read Chandler and um McDonald when I was very young. before that I read Agatha Christie and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So I had, I, I've read mystery since I started reading, really. I'm, I'm the Hardy Boys. <laughs> Most yeah. of the, many of the audience may not know who that, that was. But so, yeah, it's been in the blood and something I always wanted to do. And when my dad gave me The Simple Art of Murder by Chandler when I was a young teen, and I read, you know, something different where, hey, the bad guys sometimes aren't caught and it's kind of great instead of black and white. That, I was a young teen at the time, we were a little rebellious, so that kind of clicked in. And once I read that, I realized, hey, this is 40 years later, this is what I want to do, uh, 30 years later with my so life. Cool. So, uh, but it took me a long time to get there. But yeah, I always, Brian's been in the blood. Um, English was always my best class. And I think I, I learned to cheat back then. I'll, I'll tell the youngsters <laughs> that I don't even know if they write papers in English anymore. But when you had to write a paper, I always tried to have a little humor in mind because I figured, all the papers really the, the poor teachers going through all these kind of dull and probably not very well written papers. Yeah. So I'd throw a touch of humor, and uh, I think that contributed to me getting decent grades. Oh, no doubt. Because <laughs> not that I write funny easy. at all now, anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> so when dark. you were when you were a kid, did you have any imaginary friends? I mean, did you <laughs> play alone and do all that? <laughs> well, I was. I have a theory about all this. It didn't well, touch. that's funny. Funny you should say that. Uh, I was four out of five, but my my. My brother was my, my late brother, God rest his soul, was five and a half years older than me. And uh, you know, he gave me some physical abuse. He beat he beat me up, which was fun. Uh we used to put on <laughs> sweatshirts and do hockey fights where you, you know, you couldn't hit in the face or anything, but you'd pull the shoulder over and just do the uppercuts. Um <laughs> it was a loving relationship. Uh <laughs> but he's he was a great man. I really respect him. But so my next my next sibling was my middle sister, and she's probably about three and a half years older than me, maybe three. 
And so I did have time. My younger sister was four years younger than me. So I did have time by myself. And I used to play with army men. And I had old stories going with the army men. They weren't always army men. They could have been cowboys and Native Americans and yeah. the whole deal. Um, but I did, I did have an imaginary friend. And his name was Bob Martin. And <laughs> it's a family name. secret. I love it. Family Not anymore. secret that I just let out. My, my dad actually at one point <laughs> made a shirt that said, Where's Bob Martin? Um, I don't even, I really don't even remember it, but apparently I had, the, I had my little friend, Bob Martin. Um, yeah, well, so there's hilarious. some psychosis. There's what, what, psychosis what happened there. to Bob? Uh, well, I'm the mystery writer. He died. <laughs> Murder Steve happened. Poor cold, Bob. Cold case, cold case at this point. We still haven't figured it out. <laughs> but yeah, because I mean, I, I just have this theory that a lot of writers, were making up stories in their heads and probably had dialogue going back and forth with yeah. their imaginary friends or their toys or whatever. And it was kind of a precursor to writing dialogue later in life. And, and absolutely. Doing yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and with the army man, I had the whole, I had a whole series of stuff going on and actually it almost <laughs> got me, it almost got me killed playing with my little army man. There was a sliding glass door out to the backyard and I, there was a, this, cabinet my dad put in where we'd have the black and white television and it, I, my army men were in the cabinet underneath so that's where i play right there so i'm playing with them and one and my brother's mowing the lawn one day and he hits runs over the little edge i guess they're broken off of a one of those old little sprinklers that had the little kind of uh, oh yeah on them. yeah, yeah. That thing shot through the window right behind me i'm sure it would have it would have it would have probably drawn blood but uh yeah so uh there i'm playing with my army man and uh i got my brother editing the story out there an irrigation <laughs> accident yeah forced editing yeah yeah exactly so how old were you when you first put pen to paper as it were you know seriously saying i'm going to create something well the school count i mean um no, no I'm not, when you decide no, yeah. i'm going to be a writer i'm going to write something well uh before I got serious about it, I was doing that when I graduated from college, um, probably weeks within with my English degree, mm -hmm. which was very uh, a very good precursor for going into the restaurant business, which I did. Uh, I've got to have a degree in English to be able to do that. Um, yeah, it was then I wrote I was writing some really bad, sappy love story because, you know, my college girlfriend had broken up with me, um, had that. <laughs> And then there were times over the years, and I told myself at that point, and, and I made the mistake of telling others that I was, my goal was to become a published author, but I really didn't do it very much. I didn't write very much, but occasionally I would. It was back when, and you guys can relate to this, when I thought you need to be inspired to write, which is good. Right. For, for me, it was good for about a page and a half. And then yeah. four, months, <laughs> four months later, five months later, I do another page and a half. So yeah, it was something I always wanted to pursue and I didn't very hard until I was, I mean, I find this hard to believe that I could be older than this number, but until I was 43, I think. And I was working for the uh, fourth golf company in 10 years that I'd helped put out of business. And we're not put out of business. <laughs> Two of them were actually, or one of them was actually um, engulfed by Callaway. But, um, and I, but I was working for the smaller company and I, the, the, the handwriting was on the wall. I'd seen this, seen this uh, show before. And so I said, this is it. I was 43. I can't, I, when this thing goes out of business, I have a little money saved up. I'm going to write a book or I'm going to, or I'm going to have to find a career. I wasn't, I wasn't successful like Doug as a doctor and Kathleen, I don't know what you do or you do or did on your spare time, but I can see by <laughs> at least by the painting and the, and the interior decorating that you, you did very well. Um, <laughs> As opposed to me, I, I was in the restaurant business. I was in sports licensing. I was a sale. I was in sales, but I didn't. I wasn't looking to climb rungs. I was. I had this this dream that I never pursued. Mm -hmm. So when I was the forty three, I said, "When this thing goes down, and it's going to go down, I'm going to write a book, or I can't pretend it's something I'm ever going to pursue. And I do have to pursue some sort of career where I'm going to try to climb rungs. And for five months, every day." In my kitchen, a uh, different place than I live now, on my used IBM ThinkPad with the floppy disk drive, I wrote. And it was some of the best, honestly, the, certainly till that time in my life, the best five months of my life. I, I, I realized, good or bad, that I was doing something I was meant to do. I was doing something wow. I was 
put on the, not, I don't want to say put on the earth to do, well, whatever skills I had, this is what I was supposed to do. This was the, this was the, this were, were the tools that God gave me. And like I said, good or bad, ever get published or not, this is what I need to do. So that time in doing that told me that, yes, this is the kickstart I needed. And um, I wrote a first draft. I thought it was a book, you know, because you got, I wrote chapter one on the first page and the last page I wrote the end. I figured this is a book. Yep. Yep. Only be a small matter of time before I get the agent, buy the house in La Jolla. And I never, you know, she'll sell the book. I never, <laughs> never have to work a day job. I again. shouldn't laugh, but <laughs> no, you know that story. Story. <laughs> you should laugh. I didn't know anything. And um, my a guy I used to work with in the golf business called me up and this is, this is the God's, God honors truth that I can remember. I, it was within a week after finishing what I thought was a book. He said, hey, Matt, I'm over with the sports licensing business now, company, and we need somebody in sales. You want to come over and interview? And I said, well, you know, Eric, I didn't say this, but in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, Eric, I, I finished the book because I made the mistake of telling people that I was writing a book. And I want to ask you why that was a mistake, too. I will tell you exactly why it's a mistake. Okay. Don't anybody ever do it if you, yeah, until right. you publish. <laughs> I, uh, I said, well, you know, um, I am expecting to get the house in La Jolla, but I'll come over and help you for a little bit. And I worked there for 16 years. Oh my gosh. But yeah. I, I did write, I did write and have five books published um, while I was to have the day job, uh, yeah. but I'll tell you why it's a mistake to tell people that you're, that you're writing a book because they're, they're going to expect some output at some point. Yes. And yeah. So then when you've done this, book which is a first draft which we all know a first draft our first book is really bad so i printed them up for some people back when it was um it wasn't it was uh not fedex but whatever it was before fedex can't even remember anymore um had a little printed out so people could read them and i handed them out to people that want you know not over the place but people were hey you know can I read the book sure and family members and so now i think whenever I'm doing an event in San Diego and it's in the paper. They'll announce it in the paper or something. The people that I gave books to, I used to work with probably thought I read this guy. It's terrible. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> they, read a, they read a first draft of a first book. Exactly. Um, so exactly. I, so don't ever do that. Only your writer's group gets to see that thing. So but, I have but the fact that you clear. stayed that you stayed with it, and the fact that you realized that's what yeah. you wanted to do, I think that's the take home message for the right the writers and would be writers out there is that exactly. if you have to write, write. But if it gets exactly. published or not, if you have to write, just go do it. Yeah, work well, the muscle. I think it's really um, also important, I think, for uh, writers to understand that we all start at the same place. We all write the horrible first draft of the yep. horrible first novel. Um, how did you learn though, you know, where did you go and what did you do to actually learn how to write commercially viable fiction? Well, I did, I did have a degree in English. So I wrote a bit in college, I wrote in high school, but I did re after, after the, uh, illusion of the, the agent, the house in La Jolla and, you know, the New York times bestseller with the first book, the disappointment. I thought, I thought, well, you know, I should probably get this vetted. And so I took classes from UCSD Extension, University of San Diego, California, University of California, San Diego, in in person back then, they didn't probably even have online courses. This was over 20 years ago from a woman named Carolyn Wheat, who became a mentor to me. And as a matter of fact, I just exchanged emails with her the other day. Um, she was a mystery writer. She'd won the Agatha. She'd won oh, an wow. Anthony. I think she won a lefty. And she was um, a great teacher. Great, great teacher. Great and teacher. So, yeah, I, knew, I know Carolyn. And, and you're so blessed because very few professors who are teaching writing aren't out doing it. And she was right. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> she was a great teacher and she was a tough critiquer. And what I learned when you go to these, we'll call them adult writing classes, is that there's a lot of people there that thought, you know, I have a book in me and I have to help. There's got to be somebody to help get it out of me. I had a first draft done. So there were very few people that really had enough material to go up on the whiteboard. Mine was up every week <laughs> and a, a small segue. When I was writing it, I was called, it was what I call writing in the cocoon where and I didn't know about writers groups, any of that stuff. I was just writing every day and then revising. I did read books. I read uh, the great Lawrence Block, who I still follow this day. Mm -hmm. Every day you go back and revise what you wrote the day before and it helps you get in. So I'm reading what I wrote. I thought, oh, this is really good. This is freaking genius. And the only other person I let see it was my dad, because I wanted to show him that after 
all these years of um, talking about writing, I was actually writing. And <laughs> in a rare um, positive reviews, he said, this is pretty good. Now, whether he liked it or not, I don't know, but he said, this is good. So I thought, well, I, I'm reading it. This is genius. My dad likes it. It must be good. And then Carolyn Wheat would put it up on the whiteboard every day and just rip it to shreds. I mean, we <laughs> rip it to shreds, <laughs> and which is what I needed exactly. Of course. Right, right. So, but the good thing about that is that you learn to, um, you know, first of all, especially when I use an early writers groups, I think, okay, go ahead and critique. Okay, and I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, you're full of shit. I can't wait until I critique your work. But <laughs> my rule was the next day I'd always go back and look what something said. And if two people had a situ uh, issue with a certain passage, it was they're usually right. So, mm -hmm. but it did teach me the, you know, having to take critiques, having to get better and better and better. So I took novels one, two, and three from her. After the last one, a bunch of us, too many of us, started a writer's group. Um, we I think we had seven plus people, but that's uh, maybe eight. That's a lot. And we were, and we would read, I think 10 pages at a time. So the, the, they were very long. The groups are very long, but um, there was a woman there, Kathy Worthington, who I was in writer's groups together. There were different ones moved around different people for 19 years. I was in a writer's group with Kathy Worthington. Wow. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. but I, I really believe in them. I'm not, I'm not in one now. I haven't been through the past couple of books, but I really think it's a great, um, mm -hmm tool to have and it's not just because it's not just learn getting critiqued and having to improve your own work i think that the, the action of critiquing i think makes you a better yes. writer absolutely for sure. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. so yeah. somewhere along the line you came up with what i feel is one of the iconic characters in crime fiction and that's rick cahill i mean i've yeah. read all the books and i've sure. followed his whole life <laughs> i feel like i know him well uh, how did you come up with him and, and, and what, what made that character resonate so much with you? Yeah, it's interesting. That's good. I, thanks. Thanks for the, uh, um, kind words. And that means a lot to me from both of you. Um, really does when you, when you're writing, you know, when I first started writing, I thought years ago, if I ever get published, well, there'll be somebody out there that really can't wait for my book to come. I'm not saying you, those are you guys, but I'm saying, can't wait for my book to come out because like I wait for all the great mystery reader, writers to right. come out and I would be with like one of their favorite um, authors and to, to and I'm not saying like again I'm not saying it's you guys but I'm saying just to have that where you kind of get that feeling where people are hey when's your next book coming out it's just a, an amazing thing but I'm, I'm having a full circle experience coming up next weekend I, the, I don't know if you guys you may or may not know this This conference is called the Southern California Writers Conference Kathleen yes. probably yes. oh you do know about it yes yeah and it's the 38th one this weekend, but I went to, it was the first writer's conference I went to probably 20 years ago or more. And they had read and critique there and another first draft situation. Alan Russell, um, I don't know if you guys know Alan Russell, um, good mystery writer from San yeah. Diego. He was one of the readers. And back then, this is an unbelievable thing. <laughs> they read 30 pages, 30 oh. pages. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's a big critique. I know, but I, yes. And he gave me some great advice, which was, if, once again, I was writing in the cocoon. I, nobody was looking at it. My dad liked it. After a while, I thought, yeah, he, you know, he's probably being nice. So as a first person outside of my cocoon and, and a professional was reading it, and he said, you know, you can write. And I thought, wow. And I, just, I think he was being honest, and that means a lot to me. But he said, but it's, your the story is much too autobiographical. And that was some of the best advice it did. More and more, each revision, I got further away from Rick Cahill, and it made I got to a much darker character where I wanted to go. But I, I started to say a full circle thing. When I, I remember at that conference, sitting at the banquet, the first thing thinking, "Man, wouldn't it be cool to be the banquet speaker and you know someday come back and be the and so this next Saturday I'm going to be the the banquet speaker at the place with ten, <laughs> oh, ten books so under cool. my belt now. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, Alan giving me that advice in every revision. I, I took that to heart, got further, further away. And I, mm -hmm. I've told this story before, but it's true. I really think the key thing that happened to me with finding who Rick was, was a line that came to me from the subconscious, which Carolyn Wheat told me many times was a better writer than I am, which I agree with, which was the first time I saw her, she made me remember and she made me forget. 
And that became the first sentence of the, of the first book, Yesterday's Echo. But it really made me realize oh, there's, a lot, there's a lot more pain in this guy's life than I've been writing. It's a lot darker. Yeah. There's a need for him to find some joy in life. And so that subconscious getting its way in there um, mm -hmm. helped me get on that darker figure. Um, so the further I have got I got away from him, the more this is the character I wanted to write. It was too light in the beginning. It had a little too much of the very uh, cliche-ish, uh, double entendre stuff. And I moved further away. There was still, there was a little bit of that, especially in the first book. But the more I moved away from that, the more I realized it's just that this guy's had a hard life and he's trying to put it back together. And his his uh, wife had been murdered before right. the first book, and he was wow. he felt responsible in some ways, and he was actually arrested but released. Um, so with every book, he's trying he's trying to redeem himself in some ways because he does feel responsible for his wife's death. So that that gave me if you're writing a series character, you kind of need um, a hook, something that he lives by. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. that need to find the truth and also um, something was passed down to him by his father who'd been a cop and thought to be a bad cop, which is sometimes you have to do what's right when the, even when the law says it's wrong. And so I had those kind of hooks like, OK, when I'm writing this guy, this is his baseline. This is who he is. So I could hook into those things. And um, in each book, maybe got a little darker, but there was kind of a little bit. <laughs> I mm -hmm. see his life a little bit of a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Um, like one happy ending for me was when he got shot in the face, but he got a new girl. So that was, <laughs> you know. yeah, yeah, Rick, Rick, not only evolved as a, as a person and, and what you're talking about and what I really enjoyed about it, but he even, you know, not only did he have a past that was, that was dark and troubled and painful, but he had a lot of stuff happen to him along the yes. way, a lot of injuries and illnesses and right. blindness and you know all kinds of stuff that went on. And, and and it really made him a very rich character. Well, well, a lot of them were were the the, the illnesses and the wounds were courtesy or not courtesy, but hopefully getting it right thanks to Doug Lyle. Well, um, that's why I know many, Rick many so well. Doug, many emails, <laughs> but yeah. So when I think of Rick, when I think of the, if you're looking at it from thirty thousand feet, you're going, "There's no way. There's no way somebody could live this life. He cannot be shot this many times. He cannot have that many stab wounds." Anytime he takes his shirt off or some situation, I have to remember, oh, my, because I don't have a Bible, which people should. I don't have a Bible about his life. I have to go back and read, see, where was he stabbed? And when he was almost gutted, it was on the right <laughs> or the left side, right. when he was the, the throat. Um, but so it's it's ridiculous. It's it's a, No one can live that and have that many not lives. But well, the one I'm writing, I'm thinking, this is, this is the life he's lived. This is who he is. He's a flawed character. He gets himself in trouble because some of the decisions he makes. He has this, this manic uh, need to find the truth, no matter what he's uh, case he's working on. And so if I, in one or two week period, that drive plus dealing with some bad people, can these things be realistic? And I try to make it as realistic as possible in those situations. And the one thing that I started with uh, way back when was I had two rules. One was no sidekick, no, oh, no humor sidekick, no, um, Superman psychic to get him out of bad uh, situations and no financially guy can pull him out of, uh, you know, sit, get him bail and stuff. Um, and I raised that in the second book when I came up with Mortimer McFarland, another PI who's to me, the conscience of the series. And thank God I made that. I somehow found her because I, I don't think I would have written 10 books because it would have been too dark. I probably loved how dark it was, but it just been too dark. Yeah. But the other one was um, that everything that happened, uh, uh, it's its not a hat tip to the great Michael Connolly, but, you know, everything matters. Um, all, all his thing is all um, everyone matters. Nobody matters. With Rick, I, I was everything, every scar, physical and emotional has to carry over. It has to matter. There has to be uh, repercussions from those. And so. I, I and this the and it, initially it was certainly the more emotional scars that have carry over and they still do, but then I figure well this guy, box Golden Gloves a teenager for three or four years he played football from Pop Warner to junior and uh, sophomore in college, he was a cop he said we've seen him have concussions um, in some of the books, I thought well this guy's got CTE chronic traumatic encephalopathy, how could he not and so I thought well, I really want to do this. And I said, well, I can't, if you're going to live by this rule, that my own rule, nobody else knew it, didn't have to do it. But I said, well, I have to give it to him. And my publisher thought, well, why are you doing that? It's a fairly successful series. <laughs> why give him a, 
potentially deadly disease, a shortened lifespan for sure. But I had to, and it opened things up for me uh, to do that. So long story short, my whole... Um, Which brings my, us to here. Oh, thanks. Yes. Uh, <laughs> long story short, the reason, you know, you talk about all things that happened to him. I couldn't, I didn't want him to be the story where the guy gets shot in the shoulder in the uh, first chapter. And then in the sixth chapter, he's pitching batting practice in the Padres. Um, I had, everything had to carry over. I thought, well, he's got CTE. Um, but it did make things more interesting for me, uh, more challenging for sure. And then when I gave him a new wife and a, ch- and a baby, a child, that I never intended to do that either. Never intended to do that. That made uh, all these bad decisions he makes. He has to weigh them more because now it's not just him and and his lo- his dog Midnight. That's it's he's really affecting people's lives if he's not going to be there. And that really you just put up Odyssey's end. Think that really that's foremost in front of um, him at this book is um, can I continue to do this? Well, actually, it goes to I know I'm rambling on. You can cut some of this. Um, it goes to, he's got CTE in two books. This is the third book with CTE. Mm-hmm. And I don't really do look at the, uh, symptoms that much in this book. I look at how it affects, how it affects him in the long run. He's thinking he's estranged from his wife when it opens, he gets to see his child a little bit, but they're not all living together. He wants to put his family back together. And if he can't put his family back together, he knows the average life for someone CTE is 53 years is 43 mm-hmm. in this book. If I can't put my family back together, I want to have a safety net for Krista, his daughter, when life knocks her down. And he knows better than anybody, life will knock her down. But in doing that, and and miracle, he gets an opportunity to when an old nemesis knocks on his door looking for help. And he knows he can't trust the guy, but it's enough money to really, really seed that safety net. So he can't, and even though it's the kind of thing that drove his wife out of his life, is he has to do this for his daughter. And throughout the book, he's really thinking about family and, you know, what I need to do to keep the family going or try to possibly get back together as I'm still making yet another bad mistake. So well, I have to um, point out it was nominated for a lefty this year. So oh, uh, congratulations yeah. there yeah, for best novel. That's uh and well-deserved because this is a great book. Thank you. So I have a question about that. I mean, it's, you're obviously, and I mean, honestly, everything that you were saying is so good because it really shows how much depth um, this character has developed for you and, and how important that depth is when, because that, that's a living, breathing person at that point. And you've loved this character, but I hear you might be ending the series. Is that true? Well, it's a very uh, poignant title, Odyssey's End. Uh yeah, I've been writing Rick Cahill. It took me 10 years to get published uh, from starting on that ThinkPad. Um, and so I've been writing in probably 21 plus years. Mm-hmm. So uh, whether it's the end or not, or a pause, it is it is a pause. I'm writing something different right now. Um, I can't imagine not being in Rick's world anymore after first person. I mean, he's a part of me. I'm a part of him. Mm-hmm. But I am... I. I feel the need to challenge myself and do something different. And it's also some business reasons for it. Um, so. Uh, Could you tell us what it is you're working on? Yeah. yeah I want to uh, hear that. Ironically, I never have a title until usually after I've written the book, mm-hmm. sometimes it comes in the middle. Um, but this one, I had the title before I really had the book and it's called who knows if I, my agent, Kimberly, yeah, right. has, exactly. as Doug knows very well, Kimberly <laughs> sells it to, we're looking to, you know, level up if, Kimberly sells it and I hope she does. The title may go out the window, but it, right now it's called Temecula Sky. Um, it's Rick and Rick. Huh? It's not Rick. Uh, his actual name is uh, Tim Kincannon, and uh, his first name is a hat tip to my late brother who I lost two years ago, um, a year and a half ago. Uh, and Kincannon, Lat Coy, last name. People used to call him TC, my brother. So um, he's a, it's, a, it's very Rickish here in the beginning. And I am writing the third person, though. So a little separation there. Very close to her, though, but he's a former cop who's half t- had to leave the force. His lieutenant, he's done something that only his lieutenant knows. And his lieutenant said, You have, you're done. You know, if we, if you're going to make me take this to the where it needs to go, you, you could go to jail. So, so you have to leave. And I, 
as the book develops, we'll find out why he did what he did. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's his father is a former cop, but he is um, debilitated now. And uh, Kincannon is a private investigator. He's been one for a couple of years, but he's not making enough money it's because he's divorced, too. He's got to pay what we used to call alimony. And he's helping his father with his 24 hour care. And so the opportunity to work for a public defender's office in Temecula comes across to temporarily fill in for an, an investigator. And he can't, um, you know, he can't bypass it. He needs to do it. But he's a true believer. Like There's a thin blue line. He's over here. He's a true believer. And he's working with a public defender, female public defender, who's a true believer on the other side. And his father can't believe how could he be possibly working for the other side. You know, after all, he, his father was a cop. He was a cop. How can you do this? And he ba- he battles with this, and you know, how can I try to help people get off that I would be putting in jail otherwise? And that's the wow. premise. There's a there's it, it expands wide, hopefully, but that's the premise. So I came up with that idea when I uh, was dating a public defender a couple of years ago. She lives in Temecula, and I thought, well, this, you know, I was talking to her about the book. I said I can't even finish the book I'm writing now. I want to get into this so badly, and. Uh, I was under contract, so I finished Odyssey's End, or actually it might have been Doom Legacy at the time. I don't remember. Um, but then she broke up with me, and I didn't know what to do. I had this net, this whole idea. Can I do it without her input? Uh, but then we got back together. So we back uh, <laughs> back Friday, we'll be back together for a year, and things are going really well. Uh, her name's Juliet. She's wonderful. But she's so smart, and so I've learned so much because my background is law enforcement. My brother-in-law. My late brother-in-law was a cop in L.A. for 33 years. His son's been a cop now for 17 years. Yeah. Both daughters married cops. So I've got that in my background. And I've learned so much. This obstacle she has to come up with working with people that are indigent. And, and pretty much almost all of them are mentally ill. The, the, mm-hmm. the, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And um, so it's been really interesting. And she, uh, she's she got stories every day, though, of the stories every day. And the first when we first started dating, Let's give this brief one. She texts me, uh, I think from the from the courtroom, texts me, my my client is bald and he's got a uh, tattoo on his head and it says, bitch, please, P-L-E-A-V-E. <laughs> so the whole time we're trying to figure out, wait a second, was what it is supposed that? to be bitch, leave or bitch, please? Yeah, right. <laughs> so I actually put that into the, uh, I put that in the first chapter of what I'm writing now. <laughs> But did you decide it was, or do we have to read to find out? No, I don't, he, as he's trying to figure it out, there's a ruckus in the courtroom as Kincannon is watching because it's before he's he's going to start the job. He wants to get a feel for it. And he's watching her in court because he knows he'll be working with her. And this goes to another. I put two things together she told me about. One is, as we watch court TV, not court TV, but as we watch dramatics TV on, and uh, there's so much law and order type stuff, you'll see everybody standing in front of the the bench talking to the judge. Well, you're not really allowed there. That's the, from the, ta- the table, the prosecutor defense table up until the front of the, the bench is called the well and nobody's allowed in the well. That's why they call it a uh, sidebar. They go to the side. Mm-hmm. And so Julia was telling me one day that she had a, a client. He started to get physical. I don't think it was with her, but he's just kind of going, maybe he's going after the judge. And so the deputies run in and so she gets out. She wants to get out of there. She runs in the well and she starts, she, she starts screaming, I'm in the well, I'm in the well. So she, wants people, she wants people to understand that you know I'm in, I'm in the well but I can't help it. so I put those two scenes together actually to start the opening thing is um you get a little bit this guy was a homicide cop and you get a little bit he sees a tick from the back like in the in the in the defendant's neck and he realized something's you know this guy may go off and he's mm-hmm. looking at the the bailiffs or really deputies like are they watching this and so he he jumps in gets to the middle of it as she runs into the well and screams I'm in the well <laughs> wow. Anyway. wow well i can't i can't wait to read that but rick this is I mean, this has been fantastic and, and i'm gonna miss rick i am but well, uh hopefully i hope back. he comes back but yeah. matt this has been a pleasure you know we've known each other a long time and mm-hmm. and i always respect your writing and and we have the same agent and vice versa you know, and all of that so uh it, it's been great just thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you i'm a fan of both your interview a fan of both yours and Doug, you really have helped me and countless other writers with the medical advice you give. You're so free with your time; it's really appreciated. Well, thank and, you for that. Uh, but yeah, it really knowledge helps. is only useful if it's shared. That's that's my tagline. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
But really, thank you so much, Matt. We've got to have you back. You are a fabulous you. interview. So really a lot thank of you. fun. Thank you. Okay. And everybody, it. when you see this, go down and hit that little like thing and subscribe to our uh, our uh, YouTube channel here. Yes. And so we can have more great interviews with great people like Matt and uh, Matt, I'm sure I'll see you soon. Um, yeah. And uh, I'll talk about you behind your back with Kimberly. So there's that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> get, in, get in line. <laughs> yeah, right. So until next time, uh, this has been get to know on the outliers YouTube channel and we'll see you soon. Thanks guys.